Good morning. Good morning. I'm actually starting a few seconds early. There's just such quiet, such a pall. And I suspect it's because this has been a very grievous week for sports fans, the Yankees, Penn State. Very, very sad. But uh, <laughs> anyway, we will survive. Uh, we're glad that you're with us. Uh, please remember, as always, the friendship books are in your pews. Uh, pass them, sign them. Let us know you're here and if you have any special uh, prayer requests. Uh, after church today, in the library, there will be adult uh, Sunday school. Uh, most of those who attended the organizational meeting have a booklet, and they will be discussing, they will begin their discussion of that book. Uh, also, after church today, there's going to be a meeting of parents of children of Sunday school age, and we're going to talk about the uh, Sunday school for this coming year. Uh, after a year of pandemic, it's going to be nice to have Sunday school again and have some younger faces with us. Yay, Kason. Um, <laughs> it's good to see you here. Uh, because we at least have Kason, and we may have others, uh, the parents weren't sure whether they are going to make it for just the meeting or for the service as well, um, and they may come a few minutes late. But there are a few changes to the service, just so you know, I'll walk you through the service. After Renee's anthem, I will have a children's sermon. And then after the children's sermon, they will be excused to go back with uh, Carol Shear and, um, well, the Carols and Carol Burkheimer. It's, we worked it out that way, so there were the two Carols. So it's very easy for the children to remember their names. They will take the children back and uh, work and be with them throughout the rest of the service. Uh, during the meeting time, Dick uh, is going to be uh, teaching the children high theology, right Dick? Yes, thank you. But uh, it's going to be fun for the kids. Um, work day is next Saturday. And I want to give a shout out right now to many of the trustees and Danielle, who worked very hard Friday night for a couple of hours, Saturday for four hours. Uh, they left uh, somebody, and I'm going to do this for you, Dave. Somebody turned off the dehumidifier. No bad. That's the way I would speak to Claire. If the dehumidifier is on, leave it on. We've had a very muggy, humid uh, summer, and so there was mildew down there. And uh, we spotted it, it's gone, it's nice and clean and safe, but it was a lot of work, six hours of work, so thank you for that. Um, but please, keep the dehumidifier on if you see it on. And work day starts next Saturday uh, at 9? 8.30. 8.30. And there will be refreshments and music and, uh, and work. And work. <laughs> I know you always want to emphasize that. Uh, now, the bulletin has a slight mistake. Um, we are changing the flow of time here at Laycock. Uh, so there, if somebody wants to dedicate flowers on October 31st, they may. And Sunday, November 1st, it says, well, you don't go from the 31st to another Sunday immediately. It's not like there's a time warp. That meant to say November 7th. So if you want to dedicate flowers on the 31st of this month or the 7th, then you can do so. Finally, uh, just a reminder, masks are optional. We highly encourage you to wear them. Uh, there are people in the congregation have health issues or immunocompromised, uh, and so we want to respect them and make sure that they feel safe. So that's why we urge masks, but they are indeed optional. Are there any other announcements? Seeing none. Good morning. We are going to start with counting our blessings. Um, so I'd like each of you just to take a moment and just think about something that you're grateful for. Um, we're starting on a positive note here. This is Count Your Blessings. When upon life's pillows you are tempest tossed, when you are discouraged thinking all is lost, count your many blessings, name them one by one, and it will surprise you what the Lord hath done. Count your blessings, name Count your blessings, see what God has done. 
You are a good and faithful people. In no small part, that is why you are here. That's why you come to church. But life will come. Life will surprise. Life will give us all challenges and tests, trials that we wish we could be spared. So I will invite you as we come into a time of confession, first in silence and then together, to reflect on when you have lost God, when it's felt like you have lost God, lost touch with God, and why. Why do you think that happened? Let us pray. Let us pray. Eternal God, Christ told us He would be with us forever, but there are times when we cannot feel His, Your presence. And there are times when our suffering seems so far beyond deserving. In these times, we may feel anger towards You. We may feel estranged from You. Heal us, Lord. Help us to Feel you with us. Speak to us. Amen. Yes, we may lose sight of God. We may feel, we no longer feel the presence of the Lord. But still the Lord is with us. Still the Lord seeks us, and that Lord cares. And this is why I can say to you this day, in the name of Jesus Christ, that we are forgiven. Do not be afraid to bear your soul to God. Be honest. But then you may well find the God right there with you. Amen.
case, and I expected a few more children, but you're it, so if you want to come forward. Have a seat, I'll be right there. So now you can go back with Carol and Carol, or Carol and Carol, and um, they will be with you for the rest of the service. Is that okay? Okay. You guys follow her. Follow me. Morning. 
Do any have any joys or concerns that you care to lift up? I have quite a few. It's good to have kids back. It's good to have some parents that I haven't seen in a while back. And uh, we're glad you're here with us. Our prayer person this week is Richard Buck. And uh, they've lost, if those of you who don't know it, he's a police officer and they've lost a few people and so they're shorthanded, his hours have increased dramatically, but he says that life is good. And one thing that's happened of late is he's been able to spend more time with Tiffany. He adores Tiffany, it's the light of his life. And he wanted me, he, I, I could, it was like pulling teeth to get him to speak about himself. He wanted to tell me that Tiffany is getting straight A's, that she started playing the violin, and uh, she, he also said, well, you don't have to pray for me, pray for my mother. And I said, well, we did that last week, keep praying for my mother. So anyway, let's pray for Richard and Alba. Uh, and Richard is our prayer person. Renee, it's great to have you back. It's been a long pandemic wait to see you. Thank you for your ministry of music. Uh, some of you have been asking how Claire is doing, and it is my great joy to tell you that she had her stitches out on Monday. We had to wait two days for her to still wear the cone of shame. But then we took it off, and she's walking, she's running, she's jumping, she's full of energy. It's like nothing ever happened, and it's wonderful to see her so happy again. And from what the vet says, it's all behind her, so that's good. And I also was speaking to somebody this week who told me that Dawson's, he assured me, lived to be 20 or 25 years old, so I'm going to go with that. Um, <clears throat> the altar flowers are in memory of uh, Edna and George Mowry, given by Nancy McGuigan and Phyllis and John King. Uh, we want to celebrate the lives of Edna and George. On a concern front, um, and Mike, you'll appreciate this. No, I'm not going to call you up. <laughs> uh, I have a friend from high school that I haven't spoken to in many, many years. I mean, I graduated from high school, what was it, six years ago or something. Anyway, uh, Rob Diefenbach uh, was a good friend of mine in high school, and through a variety of circumstances, we touched base again. And part, one of those circumstances is he's been watching these services, so um, you never know who's watching what you're taping, Mike. And I'd ask you that you pray for Rob because he's got multiple myelomas and he's undergoing immunotherapy for that, so he, he can't get out in public too much these days. Uh, and speaking of illness, uh, Emily's college roommate, Tina, uh, had a, what she thought was a mild cold earlier in the spring. Um, turns out it wasn't a mild cold, it was COVID. And she's lost her taste, uh, smell, and she cannot get it back. Uh, this is somebody who's relatively young, and, um, and so she's suffering from the long-term effects of COVID, so we want to pray for Tina. And it grieves me that once again, we have to pray for people affected by a shooting, this time at a high school in Arlington, Texas. I don't know the details, some of you may know them, but apparently there were a couple kids that got into a fight. Well, I don't know about you, but in high school, kids fight. But when you have a gun, problems can occur, and one of the kids is in the intensive care unit. So, we need to pray for all the victims and all affected by the shooting in Arlington. Are there any other, uh, uh, not announcements, uh, joys or concerns? Marsha? Um, they found that three-year-old little boy in Texas, the one who had wandered off in the world. Yes. Well, oh, that's a joy. Yeah. It's great news. Others? Let us pray. I'm God, as a good parent to a child, you rejoice in us. You delight when we thrive. You welcome times of laughter and growth. And you work in our lives in often small and surprising ways to bring blessing. 
Help us to see that blessing. Help us to stop and take the time to cherish it, to be grateful for it. This day in particular, we thank you for Richard, for Renee, for the lives of Edna and George, for a little boy who was lost and is now found, for the healing of Claire, and for all of us that we lift up to you now in the silence of our hearts. Loving Lord, though you created the world good, it is broken. Broken so often by us. In that breaking comes pain. Suffering that often seems so out of proportion to the wrongs we have done. You will to heal us. And part of that healing can come when we speak honestly to you. Even in doubt or fear or anger. Help us to know that you hear us and that it is okay to speak honestly to you. We ask that you comfort, that you bless, especially this day, Rob, all those affected by the shooting in Texas, that you be with Tina, and all others whom we lift up to you now in the silence of our hearts. And now hear us as we pray the prayer Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Now, in body or spirit, let us rise and sing hymn 794, O Savior, in this quiet place. We're only going to be singing the first four verses. His hand is heavy despite my groaning. 
Oh, that I knew where I might find him, that I might come into his dwelling. I would lay my case before him and fill my mouth with arguments. I would learn what he would answer me and understand what he would say to me. Would he contend with me in the greatness of his power? No. But he would give heed to me. There, an upright person could reason with him, and I should be acquitted forever by my judge. If I go forward, he is not there. Or backward, I cannot perceive him. On the left, he hides, and I cannot behold him. I turn to the right, but I cannot see him. God has made my heart faint. The Almighty has terrified me. If only I could vanish in darkness, and thick darkness would cover my face. This is the word of the Lord. Let us pray. O oh Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable to you, our rock, our redeemer. Amen. It's a ritual every week. I say this is the word of the Lord. But you know, it's good to say that this week. Because this is the word of the Lord. The book of Job is the word of the Lord in all of its complexity. In all of the ways it makes us uncomfortable. That's why many people try to avoid this book. Now last week, Job's initial response to his incredible, over-the-top suffering was to name the truth of that suffering and to accept that there is good and bad in life. And that we should accept it. But his response does, didn't end there. Most scholars believe what happened this is one of the oldest books of the Bible. And that long ago, a poet learned this folk tale of a man named Job, who suffered innocence. And he took the prose, prologue, and epilogue, which is pretty simple, just a folk tale. But if you look at the book of Job, in between are many, many chapters of some of the most glorious poetry in the Hebrew language. And in those verses, in those chapters of poetry, the poet examined one of the most complex and difficult things in all of life, the problem of innocent suffering. Job's response does not end to mere acceptance of his suffering. He has, as we would hope to have, three friends no, who learned that he's suffering, and they come to cheer him up, to console him. But as the chapters go by, we come to realize they're not there to comfort Job. They're there to comfort themselves. Because the case of Job shakes their faith. It worries them. It frightens them. They end up defending God. God doesn't need our defense. God does not need our defense. They end up defending God, but what they're really doing is defending their own faith. And they come up with all these arguments. Job must be at fault. There must be a reason he's suffering. And so they trot out all these things. They say, one of them, they take turns speaking to him. One of them says, Well, maybe you sinned when you were a youth and you forgot. And Job says, No. No. And so another one says, well, maybe your children sinned and you're being punished because of your kids. And again, no. Another says, God uses suffering to teach us. And that explains everything. These are all the traditional formulas that religion teaches us to explain why confusing and inexplicable things happen in life. But they are meaningless before Job. Job is the case you cannot turn away from because it says right at the beginning he's done nothing to deserve all this. And in the 
chapters of poetry, you see flow, the flow of Job's response. He begins, he begins by internally reflecting. He acknowledges the horror of his situation, and he says in that first poetic chapter, I wish I had never been born. And he keeps on insisting on his innocence. And he parries all those worthless responses of his so-called friends. He knows they're empty, and he keeps pointing out their emptiness. In chapter 31, he gives a long list of everything that he's not done, and it's a very revealing list for the Hebrew Bible. He has never, he says, harmed orphans. Well, it runs all through the Hebrew Bible to take care of widows and orphans, and, and Job comes right and says, look, I have never harmed an orphan, so he knows what's critical. He knows what's important to the Lord. He says he has never trusted gold. He's not somebody, yes, he was wealthy, but he did. That isn't where he put his trust. That isn't where he put his faith. He put his faith in God. Material things were blessings, yes, but they weren't his focus. He says, I have never neglected the poor. And we're always called to care for the poor. He says, I've never been false to anyone, including my wife. And then he says something that really blew my mind when I was rereading this. I have never rejoiced when my enemies suffered. Wow. Have you ever been a little bit glad when somebody's been really bad to you, hurt you a lot, suffers a bit, gets their comeuppance, karma, whatever you want to call it? Have you ever been a little glad? Well, they got theirs. Job says, I've never felt that way. I've never wanted healing, even on my enemies. He says he accepts God's strength and wisdom, and he knows that no mortal can ever fight with God. You can never argue with God. And then he goes a little step further. He says, you can never be just before God, because if God wants to condemn you, God will condemn you, and nothing you say is going to change that. And that's true even when, like he is, you're innocent. Very early in this book, chapter 9, Job reaches the ultimate, wildly, almost blasphemous conclusion when he says, it is all one. God destroys the blameless and the wicked. Come right out and says that. God destroys the blameless and the wicked. In our reading itself, Job is reflecting on God. And we see that what he's longing for, and this is important, even more than getting rid of all these physical pains that he's got. He wants to find God. He wants to bring his case before the Lord. And what we have here is an image of a trial. Job's already said, I don't think I'm going to win. I'm not going to win an argument with God. But if I can only bring my case to God, maybe then I'd understand what is going on and why. And that's really what he wants, is just to understand why. And have you ever been there? Have you ever been in a situation where something has happened that has broken your heart and you want to turn to God? Maybe you did turn to God and say, Why? But you see, Job doesn't understand that life's trials aren't like those that happen in the courtroom. They don't have a neat, clear resolution. They don't have some nice legal explanation. Sometimes it can appear there's only silence. And the reality in this chapter we've read in his agony is that God cannot be found whether he goes forward or backward, right or left. He's shattered. He's shattered. Imagine what it's like to be known by someone you can never know. Or so it feels. 
He knows the Lord knows them. But he doesn't understand the Lord. He's unable to find God, and that being the case, he hopes only to be hidden. Somewhere God will forget about him and perhaps spare him all this suffering. But you know, the Hebrew, the Hebrew is a little bit ambivalent here. And the more little, literal translation of those last two verses is strange. It says, I am not destroyed by darkness. God has concealed me, has concealed the third darkness from me. And so maybe, maybe in those last two verses, God is still there, though not seen. And maybe. God still cares, and somehow, this would be the most remarkable thing, God honors what Job has been saying and will say. And if that's the case, that is really remarkable. Because in verse 2, it's translated, my complaint is bitter. And you may look at the footnote of the Bible and it says, the Hebrew says, rebellious. The word is married in Hebrew. And what this means then is Job literally is saying, my complaint is rebellious. And he knows that. He knows the friends are doing the good and pious thing. He knows that in trying to offend God, well, that's, that's obviously the thing church people and synagogue people and temple people should do. And what he's doing is rebellious. You see, this is the wonderful paradox of Job. If, remember, he was praised for his integrity, his honesty. If he maintains his integrity, he must rebel. He must challenge the injustice of his situation. Even if that means challenging traditional religious ideas. Now that's hard for people of faith to accept. If you're going to be honest, if you're going to maintain your integrity, there may come a time when you may have to be a rebel, when you may have to challenge all the things you were taught throughout your life of faith, if you're going to be honest with God. It's a matter of crying out, showing anger if you feel the anger, showing despair if you feel the despair. It's wrestling with God, which has a great precedent in the Bible. I know all about this. I know all about this. And if this is making you uncomfortable, maybe it should. I've been where Job was. I've told many of you this before. But in this context, it bears repeating. I wish you all would have met my mother. She's one of the most remarkable people I've ever known. Brilliant, beautiful, gifted. A society editor of a major Ohio newspaper right out of college. Somebody who interviewed Gary Grant and other people. Who was best friends with Irma Bombeck. Who was in Irma Bombeck's wedding party. So her life in many ways was blessed, but it didn't begin so. She was the first of her parents' children and the last. Because her mother died as a consequence of her birth. And her father, her young father, didn't know what to do with this little newborn baby girl. And so he shipped her off to live with his sister and her husband, who were too poor to have another mouth to feed. And so my mother grew up like a little Cinderella, only to be shunted back to my grandfather when she turned 13 living in a boarding house with a man who still didn't know what to do with a daughter. All her life, she dreaded doctors, 
All of her life, she was so sure that someday she would get sick, really, really sick. Finally, one day, my father heard me crying in the bathroom. He went into the bathroom and he said, Ruth, what's the matter? And she said, I think I have a lump. And she had hidden that from my dad for a while because she wanted it to go away. She wanted to pretend it wasn't there. When my father felt that lump, he realized it had grown. And immediately, he took her to the emergency room. And yes, she had breast cancer. And for years after that, she fought that cancer with all the treatments that are so debilitating that some of you know about it. Chemotherapy, radiation therapy, sapping her soul, her body. I had a sabbatical when I was a teacher. And I was living on an island off the coast of Connecticut. And one day that spring, I got a phone call. It was my mom and dad. They told me she had been for her regular checkup, and the cancer was gone. She had beaten breast cancer. And until then, I didn't know you could dance over the lines of the phone. But we all did. We all rejoiced. It was the, probably one of the happiest moments in my family's life. Now, there was a bit of strangeness there. My dad and mom were going to come out and visit me on this island, and dad was the only one who showed up. When I asked them about it, he said, oh, your mother wanted us to have a guy's weekend. It made sense. So we did. And it was great. At the end of that summer, I went to stop by my folks' house just to say hello before I had to go back and teach. Walked into the house, mom was nowhere to be found. I asked Dad, and he kind of hung his head and said, she's in the bed. I went and found her lying on her bed, barely conscious, emaciated, white as the sheet she lay on. I raised out and asked my dad, what's going on? She looks worse than she ever has. He said, we don't know. I keep bringing her to the doctor. And they keep saying, the cancer's gone. A few weeks later, they took her to another specialist. She had pancreatic cancer. Three months later, she was dead. I had to be a bit of a stoic, hide the emotions that I felt, at least visibly. My father and brother were just wrecked. And I tried to hold them. But inside, I felt rage. Where was God? It just seemed to me some kind of cruel cosmic joke. Oh, you take this, this woman who's been afraid all her life. You give her a horrible illness. And then you tease her. She thinks she's cured, only to have a far worse kind of cancer and die, all within the same year. Like Job, I railed. I spoke not of my instance, but of my mother's. And I demanded to know, why could such a thing happen on your watch, God? Obviously, things changed. <laughs> it was after that I went to seminary. So something happened. And it's the same with Job. Job has yet to change. But what he's doing is part of his integrity. It wasn't always easy. But he remained true. This is part of the sorrow of suffering. 
when you have faith. You see, on a certain level, Job never lost his faith in God. That's why Job keeps railing at God. He never stops speaking to God, reaching out to the Lord. But he also keeps his faith in himself, his honesty. And when you have faith in God and faith in what you're feeling and seeing, often the result is rebellion. Amen. Now invite your spirit. Let us rise and affirm our faith in the Savior of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son and Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under the promise of silence, as a goodness of God, God, who was buried, descended from the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. To offer healing to others who are in pain begins by offering them peace. We turn and greet each other with the peace of Christ. I'd like to thank everybody again for the faithfulness in your offerings. Please do continue them. As you can see, we're beginning to ramp up programs. Now again, we need your support. But let us pray over all of your gifts. Let us pray. God of grace, we bring to you our offering. We give it as a mark of our faith, our faith in you, in each other, and in the future of this fellowship. All this we ask in the name of our Lord. Amen. And now let us sing the hymn 834, Precious Lord. Take my hand.
speak the truth of our hearts, whatever it might be. Let us not be afraid of rebellion before you in truth. Help us never to stop trying to reach you. Now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with all of you this day and forevermore. Amen. Amen.